Hello everyone, today we're going to discuss a conspiracy theory that I just recently learned about. So let's jump right in. <laughs> I'm Cheshire Vic, and I also run a YouTube channel, which is in the description. I introduced Jackson to this conspiracy theory several weeks ago, which spawned the idea for this video. Anyway, let's get into it. Maybe you've heard it said before that we're in the sixth extinction, currently. But what does that mean? During the Phenerozoic era, that's the last 542 million years from the start of the Cambrian period to today, there have been five major extinction events. The End Ordovician, the End Devonian, the Permian Jurassic, the Jurassic Jurassic, and the Cretaceous Paleogene. There have been lots of smaller extinction events too, such as the Middle Cretaceous and the Cambrian Sinsk extinction events, but these are the main ones. Each extinction event resulted from a unique combination of factors that ultimately led to the destruction of millions of aquatic and terrestrial species. In every case, life managed to bounce back in new and diverse forms. For example, millions of years of volcanism that released vast amounts of carbon dioxide leading to ocean acidification and an extremely elevated greenhouse effect resulted in the Permian-Terrassic mass extinction. The dominant synapsids and anapsids of the Permian were highly reduced in diversity, paving the way for the diapsids to take over in the Triassic, though the dinosaurs really had to wait until the Jurassic. Later, the Triassic-Jurassic extinction was also triggered by massive volcanic eruptions. The Central Atlantic Magmatic Province, or CAMP, which ultimately split a continent and opened up the Atlantic Ocean. The CAMP cleared the deck of much of the Triassic diapsid diversity, which allowed dinosaurs to colonize many new niches and greatly increase the size and species number. Today, though, the sixth extinction isn't being caused by excessive volcanism, glaciation, or primitive trees disturbing the Earth's biochemical cycles. It's being predominantly caused by humans. We would imagine that for most people, this isn't especially surprising. After all, there are now two videos on Jackson's channel examining the effects of increased greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, see, is the Earth warming, and ocean acidification, for examples, for a lot of organisms, global warming and ocean acidification have made life a lot harder. Coral reefs, for instance, are suffering as the ambient water heats up and makes growth much more difficult, thus impacting the various fish species that live in coral reefs. By the way, humans eat a number of fish that spend at least part of their lives in coral reefs. So this impacts us, too. Regardless, just in the past few hundred years, we have caused the extinction of a number of animals, including vertebrates such as the smooth handfish, myolania, the great auk, dodo, passenger pigeon, laughing owl, thylacine, stellar's sea cow, caspian tiger, atlas bear, Caribbean monk seal, baji dolphin, quagga, and western black rhinos. And these extinctions come geologically shortly after the extinction of the Pleistocene megafauna, such as mammoths, mastodons, woolly rhinos, saber-toothed cats, and others. Their extinction, though, was likely caused more by non-anthropogenic global warming, ending the last ice age. From the end of the last ice age to today, the past 11,700 years, is known as the Heliocene. Though there are various boundaries proposed, the great acceleration of the past 70 years has been deemed the Anthropocene, the geologic epoch of humans, summarized by Stefan et al. in 2016. Anthropocene was coined in 2002 by Dutch Nobel Prize winning chemist Paul Kurtzen. 
And while its usage was controversial at first, it has since gained widespread recognition. In support of the term, Kurtzen cites, quote, about 30 to 50 percent of the planet's land surface is exploited by humans. Tropical rainforests disappear at a fast pace, releasing carbon dioxide and strongly increasing species extinction. Dam building and river diversion have become commonplace. More than half of all accessible freshwater is used by mankind. Fisheries remove more than 25% of the primary production in upwelling ocean regions and 35% in the temperate continental shelf. Energy use has grown 16-fold during the 20th century, causing 160 million tons of atmospheric sulfur dioxide emissions per year, more than twice the sum of its natural emissions. More nitrogen fertilizer is applied in agriculture than is fixed naturally in all terrestrial ecosystems. Nitric oxide production by the burning of fossil fuels and biomass also overrides natural emissions. Fossil fuel burning and agriculture have caused substantial increases in the concentrations of greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide by 30% and methane by more than 100% reaching their highest levels over the past 400 millennia, with more to follow." End quote. As ocean acidification affects phytoplankton, which have very good fossil records, we already have a geologic impact. However, there are those who are not exactly convinced of the harm that we have and are doing to the planet and its inhabitants. Which brings us now to the extinction deniers. For this, I'm going to turn things over to Jackson. Take it away. Thanks, Chesh. A 2020 article in Nature, Ecology, and Evolution titled Biodiversity Scientists Must Fight the Creeping Rise of Extinction Denial discusses these extinction deniers and some of the arguments they have employed. There are three main types of extinction denial, literal, interpretive, and implicatory denial. First, Literal denial can be easily understood as someone who simply asserts that species are either not going extinct or not going extinct at the rates determined by researchers and conservationists. For example, literal denialists might compare, say, the loss of Plasticine megafauna to contemporary extinction events and declare that modern species loss is trivial by comparison. This is nonsense. Most species that go extinct are not the charismatic megafauna but smaller organisms, flowers, frogs, lizards, birds. In the Amazon just last year, two birds, the Alagoas foliage gleaner and the cryptic tree hunter, were confirmed as extinct, and seven more species have either not been seen for a decade or are down to just a few individuals. These include the kinglet calyptera, which hasn't been seen since 1996, and the Pernambuco pygmy owl, which hasn't been seen since 2001. According to a 2019 UN report, over a million species are considered threatened, which is more than have ever been reported previously, and numerous more are likely to fall under that category as we discover them. In a morbidly funny sense, it's a bit like the people who claim that the rate of COVID cases wouldn't be so bad if we just stopped testing people. Of course, some non-biologists weighed in on the report, attempting to downplay or totally reject its conclusions. For instance, Journalist Toby Young in The Spectator wrote that the report is merely anti-capitalist rhetoric, because somehow everything concerns capitalism, I guess, saying, quote, That seems a little pessimistic, given that the number of mammals to have become extinct in the past 500 years or so is around 1.4%, and only one bird has met the same fate in Europe since 1852, close quote. This is both misleading and technically incorrect. For starters, most of the extinction events aren't happening in Europe because Europe has been inhabited by humans for a long time, placing pressures on various organisms to adapt in response. Extinction events are more likely to occur on islands, such as Madagascar and Australia, where endemic organisms occur nowhere else on the planet, as well as tropical rainforests, which have been drastically reduced due to urban development and agriculture. This argument is a bit like saying, there's no fire in my living room, therefore there's no fire in my neighbor's kitchen. As for European bird extinctions since 1852, the bird Young is referring to is the common button quail, which was declared extinct in Europe in 2018, though it persists in Africa and India. However, the slender-billed curlew, 
whose range included Europe, hasn't been seen since 2004, and even then, only 50 adult individuals were known. As a result, it has been listed as critically endangered by the IUCN, though this species is considered likely to be globally extinct. Moving on, the second type of denial is interpretive denial. This can be summarized as, economic growth alone will fix the extinction crisis. One of the most popular proponents of this position is Danish author Bjorn Lomborg, who wrote, quote, Rich countries are increasingly preserving forests and reforesting thanks to higher agricultural yields and changing attitudes to the environment, close quote. Again, this is misleading. Richer countries tend to outsource environmental damage to poorer countries. So, for example, while temperate forests may be increasing in spatial coverage, tropical rainforests are still being deforested at millions of hectares per year. And even if a country is bettering its economic situation and reforesting, deforestation can still occur at a higher rate. Just look to Bangladesh as an example a coastal nation also exposed to the impact of sea level rise and changing typhoon frequency and intensity. Further still, reforestation doesn't always help local wildlife, especially since the trees planted to repopulate the forests are often non-native species. These non-native species can then be cut down for timber and pulp, so really the native organisms aren't benefiting all that much. Another version of this denial is that the resurgence of one particular species is often used as a proxy for others. For example, the resurgence of the Eurasian brown bear doesn't indicate that other species are resurging as well. The white-backed woodpecker is still declining in Nordic countries, even though the Eurasian brown bear might be doing better. Others, such as journalist and former parliamentarian Daniel Hannan, have argued that capitalism alone will save species from extinction. This is just nonsensical. Capitalism is an economic system, not an entity, and capitalists don't necessarily have any reason to think beyond the horizon of short-term profit to save species unless those species provide some measurable economic benefit to their investors, especially ones who live far from where the species are under threat. Will capitalists save an endangered species of Amazonian tree frog just for conservation purposes? Unlikely. Will some save tigers because tigers are charismatic animals and can bring in revenue to zoos? Possibly. In fact, Hannon cites an article discussing how the Indian tiger population has risen by 30%. But according to the article, this is due to better management of protected areas, not economic growth per se. Capitalism alone is not necessarily bad for the environment, since you can have for-profit private ownership of the means of production without deforestation, but the history of its practice means desirable environmental outcomes are by no means automatic. Lastly, the third form of denial is implicatory denial, which can be summarized as technological fixes and targeted conservation interventions will overcome extinction. To an extent, this is true. Better conservation efforts will certainly help slow species extinction, and technological improvements in such fields as agriculture, pun intended, will likely reduce deforestation as well as global warming and ocean acidification. But again, we come back to the same problem as with interpretive denial. Better technology in richer countries doesn't help the technology in poorer countries until it becomes used there too, and that involves how investment capital is made available globally. The technology and conservation efforts must be shared by both and be deployed in time, or else the species extinction and deforestation will continue in poorer countries. So, that's extinction denial. People attempting to downplay or reject that species are going extinct at higher rates due to a combination of poorly managed agriculture, deforestation, global warming, and ocean acidification. While we may not think that the extinction of some small animal in the Amazon or Great Barrier Reef is worth worrying about, eventually, we're going to drive to extinction some animal we do rely on. So, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.